Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I'm Adam Posen, the Institute's president, and I'm delighted to welcome you for the start of Macro Week here at the Peterson Institute, going out globally, and importantly, today for a major speech and discussion with Lawrence Wong. Lawrence is Singapore's Minister for Finance and Deputy Chairman of the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Uh, he is going to be speaking today on growth, inclusion, and sustainability in a post-pandemic world. What I've come to count on from Singaporean officials is forthright analysis that goes beyond those gross terms and talks in very specific ways about what the world community and the world economy, and for that matter, small economies in small states like Singapore can contribute to these global matters. In that regard, we're very fortunate to have Minister Wong with us today. Minister Wong was recently named the formal leader of the fourth generation group in his party in Singapore, but globally and economically, he is, of course, the Minister for Finance. He's been elected three times as a member of parliament in Singapore starting in May 2011. And he's previously held positions in the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of Communications and Information, the Ministry of Culture, Opportunity and Youth, the Ministry of National Development, and the Ministry of Education. Very importantly, he co-chairs the Multi-Ministry Task Force on COVID-19. He's a member of the board of the GIC, the Future Economic Council, the Research, Innovation, and Enterprise Council of Singapore, and the National Research Foundation Board. He also co-chairs the Singapore-Shanghai Comprehensive Cooperation Council. Minister Wong is no stranger to the U.S. shores. He received his bachelor and bachelor's and master's degree in economics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, respectively. He also holds a master's degree in public administration from the Harvard Kennedy School. So with that, and to launch our macro week, please allow me to introduce the minister. Thanks very much, Adam, for the warm introduction. And thanks to the Peterson Institute for hosting me today. Let me focus my remarks, as Adam said, on the prospects for growth, inclusion, and sustainability in a post-pandemic world. And I would say from the outset that my views of the world are shaped by the circumstances of a small country. After all, Singapore is a city-state without a domestic hinterland. And so in many ways, we are like the proverbial canary in the mine because we are often amongst the first to be buffeted by global economic storms. And it also means that we take a deep interest in the world and keep looking out for risk and opportunities, both for ourselves and the global system as a whole. Like what's happening with the current headwinds in the global economy. Economies everywhere have still not fully recovered from the lingering effects of COVID-19, especially in restoring supply chains. And we now face another major challenge precipitated by the war in Ukraine. We are, now, we are not out of the frying pan, but already into another fire. These headwinds accentuate and interact with the structural challenges of growth, inclusion, and sustainability in complex ways. First, the issue of lackluster growth and the secular decline in productivity, growth in particular, something which many countries were already grappling with before COVID-19. The dramatic fall in output following the COVID-19 outbreak was clearly the most dramatic shock to economies in living memory. But the world was hardly in good economic health beforehand. For the past decade, growth in advanced economies has been disappointing, despite macroeconomic map policies being generally accommodative. Economists have been trying to understand the reasons for this and the risk of secular stagnation. Now, we are faced not just with the threat of slower growth, but also higher inflation induced by the pandemic and the Ukraine war, as well as the effect of domestic macroeconomic policies in some countries. In short, the risk for both growth and inflation are weighed significantly on the downside. 
it is almost a certainty that inflation will be higher for longer. And we will therefore face a sharper trade-off between growth and inflation. This complicates what is already a very difficult task for central banks, particularly in the advanced world, the task of balancing growth and inflation. And it remains to be seen whether central banks can successfully guide their economies to a soft landing. Compounding these challenges to growth is a more fundamental and worrying shift in the global economic environment. The high tide of globalization is ebbing. I do not expect a reversal of globalization, but we could be heading into a new era of decoupled globalization. There is already renewed momentum by multinational corporations to reshore production back to home countries, diversify supply chains, and stockpile inventories. In other words, the highly efficient just-in-time global supply network is being reconfigured to account for one's unimaginable tail risk. Some diversification, no doubt, can improve supply chain resilience, but diversification is not decoupling. Will we see a further decoupling of trade, technology, or even finance now that it can be used so effectively in response to war? Will we all start to reduce our dependencies on other countries just in case they turn out to be unfriendly in future? The hope for some decades has been that trade could tamp down geopolitical rivalry. But we are now seeing another logic at play, with geopolitics having the potential to undermine trade instead. It is too early to tell what decoupled globalization will look like. But we must be prepared for a more divided world economically that will mirror a more divided world politically. And all this will have an impact on global growth and will also hit the poorest and most vulnerable countries the hardest. It will make it harder for developing countries to converge with the advanced world. And this brings me to the second challenge of less inclusive growth, both across and within nations. It's not just the size of the economic pie that's causing concern, it's also how the pie is divided. Compared with 40 years ago, the richest in most societies are further ahead than the poorest, both in terms of how much they own and how much they earn. At the same time, intergenerational mobility has weakened. Social classes have become increasingly entrenched, and the individual's starting point has increasingly determined his or her outcomes in life. Within countries, there is also a geographical dimension to this divergence. Some regions are growing and prospering as open cos cosmopolitan centers, while others are lagging behind and turning inward and more nationalistic. Part of the reason is the rapid churn brought about by rapid technological advances. Labor substituting technology has contributed to the shrinking of middle-class jobs in some industries, and this has often been concentrated geographically. As a college student in Wisconsin and, and, and in Michigan in the early 90s, I could already see the decline in manufacturing jobs then. And I can appreciate how the challenges must have increased manifold over the decades. Inclusive growth has been made more difficult by the pandemic. Unskilled workers and women have suffered disproportionately. In Southeast Asia alone, COVID-19 has pushed nearly 5 million more people into extreme poverty. And the impact of school closures on human capital formation for our young has been pronounced. So the consequences of these factors, weak and uneven income growth, high inequality and weak social mobility, pose significant risk for us all. When people feel that the odds are stacked against them, when they cannot reach the top no matter how hard they try, when their children will never do better than them, social stability is affected and things start to fall apart. 
Third, the need for meaningful action on climate change grows greater. Global warming continues apace whether we care to notice or not. And with so much attention on the war in Ukraine and the pandemic, understandably, the latest IPCC report on the increasing severity of climate change didn't attract headlines the way it should have. And the findings are sobering. Even if the world were to follow through with all its current national climate commitments, we are still on track for temperatures to rise by 2.2 degrees Celsius by the end of this century. 2.2 degrees, that's... In other words, it means we will not stay below the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold that scientists believe, believe will result in irreversible impact on lives and livelihoods. With the Ukraine conflict, we can expect reliance on fossil fuels to increase even further in the short term. This may be necessary to cope with the short-term energy shortages and to keep the lights on, but it also means we must redouble our efforts in the medium and longer term to set the right price for carbon, regulate emissions, and invest in cleaner, low-carbon technologies. So I've painted a picture on growth, inclusion, and sustainability. How do we respond to these challenges? Clearly, there are no easy answers. For more than a decade, expansionary monetary policy has succeeded in buffering economies and financial systems against severe shocks. But this has had its downsides and has likely reached its limits. And as the balance of macro risk shift toward inflation, the era of easy money will come to an end. Fiscal policy, therefore, has to play a more important role. Part of this is about being able to respond quickly with immediate stimulus when needed. And many countries have done so over the past two years to stave off the most severe downsides of COVID-19 and to mitigate longer-term economic scarring. In Singapore, we too spent significant resources to tackle the public health crisis and to help workers stay engaged in training or work in one form or another. Our fiscal balance worsened by 10 percentage point of GDP at the peak of the crisis. We have been able to afford this because we are fortunate to have a strong balance sheet and substantial reserves. Our actions have enabled employment and incomes to recover to pre-COVID levels, with the unemployment rate in Singapore now back to about 3%, even with the many restrictions on activity that have helped to keep our COVID-19 deaths at one of the lowest rates in the world. Of course, it's not possible for any finance minister to sustain such extraordinary levels of spending over extended durations. In fact, Virtually all advanced economies will emerge from COVID-19 with massive increases in their level of public spending and debt. And this is from what were already extremely high levels by peacetime standards. Public debt in many countries will likely reach levels not seen since the end of the Second World War. And with interest rates rising, there will be a need at some point to taper spending or to raise revenues with to ensure more sustainable budgets over time and to gradually rebuild fiscal space to deal with future shocks. More crucially, the issue is not just about the amount of spending, but how and what we spend on. We need to repurpose fiscal policy and renew the social contract. This is not a call for bigger government per se. Rather, it is about the state playing a more active and purposeful role to achieve important longer-term goals, to raise productivity, to tackle inequality and rekindle social mobility, and to catalyze the green economy. And it is in this spirit that I would like to share three suggestions. First, we should repurpose fiscal policy and the role of the state towards building public goods and longer-term collective capacity. Across a range of countries, there has been a drift in fiscal policy towards spending on individual entitlements rather than public goods and supply-side investments. 
For example, there are studies of the US budget which suggest that in the 1960s, around two-thirds of the budget went to public goods of one form or another, infrastructure, defense, schools, hospitals, transports, for example, and one-third went to some form of benefits to individuals. Today, that balance has more than reversed. Social transfers are certainly necessary to help us deal with immediate problems, but only a focus on building collective capacity can sustain long-term growth. So wherever we are, we do need to get the balance right. How can we make public spending work better for the common good? Now, there are several good ideas from global experience and research. First, the payoff from spending on rejuvenating and expanding critical infrastructure can be immense. For example, new infrastructure is needed for the digital economy, including in digital payments. Such digital payments are already ubiquitous in many Asian countries, including China, India, and Singapore. And we are continuing to work on cheaper and faster cross-border solutions. Investing in early childhood development is another area with high payoffs. For any given dollar of spending in, in social spending, investing in early child development is likely to be more pro-growth and pro-equality than the same amount spent in other areas. It can improve life outcomes, blunt inequalities inherited from birth and home, and reduce downstream costs in redistribution. Similarly, inclusive neighborhoods with a good social economic mix and quality public facilities matter greatly to a child's life outcomes. So too is the critical work on rejuvenating areas which have experienced economic decline. And this often involves state-supported strategies in partnership with the private sector and educational institutes to attract new industries. And indeed, we are seeing such urban renewal efforts taking place now across many American cities. Another critical area of reform is in retirement benefits and health care. These are the largest government expenditure items in many advanced economies, and they are set to grow further with rapidly aging populations. Essentially, the biggest threat to the sustainability of public spending is posed by the upward march of senior lifespans. Something has to give in the longer term. Balancing pension budgets means that benefits per year must grow more slowly than wages and salaries per member of the working age population. And in healthcare, too much of the spending today is allocated for medical treatments only after people fall sick. We must invest more upstream in preventive care we must center the healthcare system around the patient, design incentives to keep them healthy and to be cared for at the most appropriate setting. In short, such investments by the state and designing the right incentives, whether in elder care, health care, early childhood development or infrastructure, are the bedrock for building inclusive and sustainable growth. But it will not be possible for governments alone to fund these investments or to resolve many of today's complex challenges. And this brings me to the second suggestion, which is to foster a refreshed common agenda between the public and the private sectors. This will need to go beyond traditional models of public-private partnerships for specific projects. We must forge wider, deeper, and longer-term collaboration between the government and industry and work towards shared goals that advance the broader interests of society. And there are many ways to strengthen such public-private collaborations. For example, in R&D, we must work together to drive technological breakthroughs in areas of pressing need, such as green solutions to tackle climate change, even when the technologies are not yet bankable or investable. And the US, of course, has lots of experience in this area. Take, for example, DARPA's role in developing the internet and GPS systems, or NASA's work with SpaceX, or most recently, the role Operation Warp Speed played in developing effective COVID-19 COVID vaccines in record time. Another area where 
We need stronger public-private partnerships is continuing education and lifelong learning to equip workers with the relevant skills for the evolving jobs of the future. And this is a key priority in Singapore. On the demand side, we've set up individual learning accounts for everyone with periodic top-ups by the government into these accounts. On the supply side, we are working with employers and training institutes to design training programs relevant to the industry. And we aim to integrate these efforts, strengthen the overall ecosystem, and ensure a good match between the skills demanded by the industry and those offered by the workforce. Taken together, what I've spoken about amounts to a major refresh of the common national agenda between the public and private sectors. But at the same time, we cannot ignore the global commons. And this brings me to my third and final suggestion, which is to strengthen multilateral cooperation on global public goods. The financing of global health security, for example, has to be seen as a strategic investment in global, global public goods that benefits every nation, rich or poor. And this has to go beyond incremental change within existing parameters. We need a fundamental reset to strengthen the global health system. Amongst other things, we will need to massively scale up our network of pandemic surveillance systems, strengthen vaccine manufacturing and distribution cap capabilities, as well as help low- and middle-income countries build up their national health care systems to tackle new health threats before they spread beyond their country's shore. We must ensure proper and sustained funding for these global public goods and also strengthen resourcing for the WHO so that it can play its central role more effectively. The G20 High-Level Independent Panel has made its recommendations on these issues, which are now being studied and built upon by a task force of health and finance officials. A key proposal being discussed is a $10 billion global, global Health Security Financial Intermediary Fund to ensure more reliable funding to prepare for future pandemics. The contributions to such a fund, when spread out equitably over different countries, are affordable. They work out to less than 0.02% of their GDPs. It's an insurance premium well worth paying for because future pandemics are likely to happen more frequently and they can be as severe or even more severe than COVID-19. The previous and current G20 presidencies of Italy and Indonesia, with the energetic support of the US administration and several other nations, are actively working to build a broad international consensus around these initiatives. Singapore fully supports them and stands ready to do our part. I appreciate that there is already considerable fatigue around COVID-19, and there are many other important global priorities to tackle. But we cannot afford to take our eyes off the ball and fly blind into the next pandemic. So I hope we will be able to make further progress on these issues at the coming G20 finance ministers' meetings. Likewise, we need international cooperation on the global commons to tackle climate change. And the scale of investments needed here is much larger, not billions, but trillions every year over the next 30 years. That's why governments alone cannot afford these investments. We must find ways for the public sector to crowd in and incentivize the private sector. And there are many examples of how this can be done, including ways to achieve a fair sharing of risk on such investments through blended finance. We will also need to improve the availability, quality and comparability of data to enable companies, financial institutions and investors to measure progress towards sustainability goals and implement a consistent set of global standards for disclosures and reporting. Indeed, there has been an increased momentum of cl critical climate finance initiatives over the past year, and Singapore is actively involved in many of them. We must all do our part 
as regulators, standard setters, investors, asset managers, and financial service providers to scale up green finance globally. More broadly, we will have to fortify multilateralism and the global rules of the game. Over the past half a century, the open rules-based international order has helped keep the world relatively stable. It was never perfect. There was never agreement on all global issues. But this stability fostered international cooperation and gave birth to an era of unparalleled economic transformation. Many countries prospered and millions were lifted out of poverty. Today, the world seems more divided than ever before. The future has never seemed more uncertain. But amidst our differences, we must find enough common ground with one another to solve our collective problems. We must keep our international system open and inclusive. We must arrive at new sustainable working arrangements between countries, including reworking and strengthening global institutions where necessary. Failure to cooperate internationally, preserve stability, and invest in the global commons will have disastrous long-term consequences for the entire world. Let me conclude. Governments and societies today face immense uncertainty and deep structural challenges. Our response must be to drive inclusive and sustainable growth. And this will require a repurposing of fiscal policy and the role of the state, a renewing of the social contract, and a reinvigorating of the open and rules-based international order with stronger commitments to multilateral solutions. This is an ambitious agenda, but it is not impossible to achieve. Our current challenges have ignited an intrinsic desire to create hope and do better for the future. Let us seize the moment to build a more prosperous, united, fairer, and greener world. Thank you. Please. Thank you, Minister Wong. Thank you. As if the, audi the live audience online, you could hear them applauding if, if you listen carefully. <laughs> um, you covered an amazing amount of territory from global to domestic, from fiscal to climate. I'm going to, there's almost nothing you didn't touch. What I'd like to do is go back to some of the themes you raised sure. and ask you to go in a bit more detail. Let, let's start with fiscal policy because you had a quite powerful passage talking about the uh, huge run up in fiscal policy in recent years in response to COVID. So have among, not just you, but among finance ministers, among legislators, in the major economies, including Singapore. Do you think attitudes have changed? Do you think we've come out of COVID and said, it's time to consolidate? Have we come out of COVID and said, hey, discretionary fiscal policy is really good, let's do more? I mean, what role do you think fiscal rules can play? Sure. In constraining these things? Well, I think in response to the current situation where you see, in the run-up to where we are now, you have had, had the situation of excess demand, understandably because of COVID-19, and then meeting supply shocks induced by the pandemic and also the war in Ukraine. And because of the excess demand, supply tightness, you've got inflation. And given the current situation, the threat of inflation, the threat of slower growth, even the threat of stagflation, both monetary and fiscal policies have a part to play. Monetary policies should rightfully focus on tackling inflation and ensure that inflationary expectations are well anchored. And then on the fiscal front, uh, there is certainly scope to be more accommodative to cope with the impact that may happen on the real economy. But as I was trying to explain just now, it's not just how much you spend for counter-cyclical reasons, it's also the composition of the spending and the design of specific reforms. 
to focus on delivering public goods, supply-side investments. I think these are important. I think there is also scope for fiscal rules to ensure sustainable public spending, um, particularly on debt financing. It's un unfortunately on this matter, the track record of many advanced economies is, is not been encouraging. Uh, it's just a one-way trajectory for debt to go up. It used to be in peace, in crisis, debt goes up. In peacetime, debt comes down because you pay off the debt. I think in, in, in the last few decades, you have had more debt in bad times, more debt in good times. And I'm not sure how long this can last. That is not a free lunch. Someone has to pay for it eventually. Future taxpayers will have to pay. And at some point, there will be a limit where debt repayments, uh, you, you lose the credibility of debt repayments. And this can happen very quickly. Of course, debt limit will vary from country to country. Bigger countries will have more latitude. If you are the US with a continental size economy and the global reserve currency, you have much more latitude than Singapore. But still, there will be a limit. And at, at some point in time, I think countries will have to find ways to taper off spending and ensure that they rebuild fiscal space to cope with future shocks. Thank you. Um, you also mentioned, and of course, as we said, you're, you mentioned inflation. And of course, as we said, you're also deputy chair of the Monetary Authority of Singapore. So when we look around the world's inflation, and in the US, there is a debate about how much inflation is structural due to recovery from COVID, energy shocks, and how much is excess demand, like in the US. You made some mention of that. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, the more sophisticated observers also point out on both sides, for now at least, going to credibility, long-term interest rates seem to be well anchored. Yes and which central bankers tend to say means inflation expectations are well anchored. Yes. Do you think we can count on this going forward? Do you, how do you interpret? Are you very reassured by the path of long-term interest rates? I take some comfort in it, uh, but I do not take for granted that government interest rates will stay low uh, you know, as time passes. Right. I think markets for now have some confidence in the credibility of central banks and that credibility has been built up over many years in securing low and stable inflation. And that's reflected in current rates. But we should not take that for granted, which means that central banks, particularly in the advanced economies, must show decisiveness and resolve in tackling the current spate of rising inflation. So picking up on that, um, markets are pricing in roughly 250 plus basis points interest rate hike by the U.S. this year. I believe the MAS just recently raised rates. That's, well, we don't use rates. We use the exchange right. rates, but right. well, yes. similar effect. I'm glad you said that. I will come back to that. <laughs> um, but so more generally, for the small economies of the world, how do you feel, feel isn't important, but how do you respond or take into account the Fed hiking rates and its Ill spillovers on the rest of the world? How should the Fed be taking that into account? Well, I, I think, Adam, it's, it's, we are glad that the Fed has um, made clear its intent and telegraphed its um, priorities as well as the possible paths for monetary policy. Of course, higher rates means a risk of more capital outflow from emerging economies. But for the Asia-Pacific region, many economies today I would say are in a better position to withstand higher interest rates uh, because of stronger macroeconomic fundamentals. Certainly in Southeast Asia, if you look at countries in, Asia, in Southeast Asia, the emerging economies are in a much better position to do so compared to, say, the taper tantrum in right. 2013. Our fiscal and external balances are healthier, and there is a more comfortable foreign reserve coverage for short-term debt. So, you know, don't take anything for granted. You can't rule out unforeseen disruptions, but for now, uh, we, are a, we should be able to withstand the risk of higher interest rates. You mentioned, rightly, of course, that Singapore does use its exchange rate peg with the dollar mm -hmm. as its 
main instrument of monetary policy. Um, you, Singapore is one of the very few uh, high-income economies that does this kind of explicit peg at this time. Do you think this is solely a matter of size that any small city-like economy like yours has to do this? Are there other economies that can learn from your experience? And also, you're in Washington. At times, the US government has expressed concern about Singapore's accumulation of surpluses and exchange rate. What is the state of that discussion between sure. you and the USG? Sure. This, this comes up from time to time. Yes. <laughs> uh, our exchange rate, our monetary policy is based on an exchange rate framework. It's not just a US Singapore dollar, US dollar pack. It's a basket of currencies. It's a framework that is appropriate to small and open economies. And, and for an economy like Singapore, where trade is more than three times the size of our GDP, in fact, the exchange rate has a very predictable relationship with inflation. So this framework has worked well for us. I can't comment on other places, but it has worked well for us for several decades in, in achieving the outcomes we want, which is low and stable inflation. I think there are several reasons for it. One, we have always been transparent about our instrument, our objectives, and our outcomes. And this, this ensures a certain predictability in the conduct of monetary policy. It also imbues discipline in how exchange rates are set, ensuring that they are aligned with fundamentals. From time to time, we have to intervene in the markets to implement monetary policy decisions, but this is often in response to foreign capital inflows. And the markets understand what we do, and they often behave or act in line with our intent. And the second is also a very clear focus uh, on our part that monetary policy should only be used to pursue the objective of securing low and stable inflation and medium-term price stability, not for other objectives, certainly not to ensure export competitiveness, which commentators sometimes say. We do not use monetary policy for that reason. If we need to be more competitive on the export front, then we work on structural and supply-side initiatives to raise our productivity. So, we, I mean, we've, had, we, we've shared we, our framework with others. The IMF, the US Treasury, understand our framework. The IMF comes for Article 4 consultations regularly. They have endorsed our framework, and they have said that it is, the exchange rate policy is uh, appropriate uh, for the objectives that we are trying to achieve, which is low and stable inflation. Mm -hmm. With regard to current account surpluses, that comes up uh, by the US Treasury from time to time. They ask us about the congruence uh, of our exchange rate and our external balance. And we've had to explain to them, uh, and, they, and they understand this, that our current account surplus is the result of investment and savings decisions, as well as the state of development of the Singapore economy. Already over the past 15 years, the current account surplus has come down. I think it used to be 27%, 2007, it's now about 18%. And we do expect it to come down some more because of demographic change and because our population is aging rapidly. By 2030, we will be in the league of super-aged societies. I think more than 20%, 25% of our people will be above 65 years old, which means that individuals will be drawing down on their savings for consumption, and the government will also be spending more on healthcare. Right. So, so that is the more important and fundamental driver of our external position, which will evolve with time, I'm sure. No. And we've just published by our colleague Robert Lawrence here at Peterson, a piece urging American government to see our current account deficit in terms of these structural factors and not necessarily trade war. Let me turn to obviously what's a main topic this week around the G20 where Singapore is an observer at the IMF and mm -hmm. the meetings, which is the issue of financial sanctions on Russia. Yeah. Um, many people have remarked on the unprecedented scale of these sanctions. I've been more impressed as of course many others have 
about the unprecedented scope of countries involved. That Singapore, mm -hmm. for example, has gotten involved in this. Switzerland, other countries that typically are not part of sanctions regimes. So, as you've expressed on other occasions, this is in part motivated because as a small economy, a small country, you're aware of the issue of sovereignty and not having big countries bully small countries. Mm -hmm. um, I'm oversimplifying your views, but I think, I think that gets the point. How do you see going forward the use of sanctions amongst this alliance? Do you see this being very much a specific to Russia invading Ukraine, or is this a group of countries that could coordinate on sanctions for other countries at other times. How much do you see US multilateralism versus US saying, we're doing this, please come along? I mean, you can fully support the current sanctions and be worried about what happens in future, so. I appreciate the question. It's an important question. Uh, sanctions are not new, as you have highlighted, but what's new or what's different this time is the unprecedented nature of the scale and the strength of the sanctions. Um, I think it's, a, it's an effective response to the Russian invasion in this instance. But we do ask ourselves, and we all of us have to ask ourselves, how should we think about applying similar sanctions in future? From Singapore's point of view, obviously, uh, we would think that applying such extensive sanctions, you need to set a high threshold. You can't just do it, you know, willy-nilly when you feel small, a few countries think that this is the right thing to do. Uh, so a high threshold is needed. Ideally, a United Nations Security Council resolution. Not always forthcoming. Right. In this instance, it was not because Russia is a member, so the council is paralyzed, I understand. So if uh, it's not, you're not able to get a United Nations resolution, then at least consider the criteria and the basis um, in which such sanctions should be applied. And in our view, when it comes to important fundamental principles, when there are clear violations of the United Nations Charter and international root law, when territorial integrity, sovereignty and independence are at stake, I think these are important considerations and these, or these are fundamental principles and therefore you could consider making a case for applying such sanctions. After all, if crazy decisions and historical errors are the basis for invading another country, all of us, all of us, everywhere in the world will feel yeah. very insecure. Yeah. So, so I think if we set the right conditions, um, I, we will have a stronger basis for applying sanctions in future. And in fact, you may even get more countries coming on board because most countries, in fact, countries everywhere, would be able to support such core principles rather than um, you know, drawing lines between democracies versus autocracies or authoritarian states or saying this, uh, you join me because we are a group of like-minded allies. But I mean, I don't think you will get as much broad support as you were if you were to define it on the basis of violation of these fundamental principles. Thank you for spelling that out. And, and I expect that throughout this week, not just at Peterson Institute events, um, all of us are going to be hearing a lot of discussion about that issue. And I have to shamelessly mention that your near counterpart, uh, US Deputy Treasury Secretary Wally Adeyemo will be speaking here in a few hours on these issues. But continuing with your insights, um, Minister Wong, we, um, you mentioned in your opening speech the idea of what you referred to as decoupled globalization. And lots of people are talking at this point about the future of globalization. I myself have said globalization is not ending, but it is corroding to some extent. We all have different terms, but sort of going forward on that, how does a small democratic free market economy like Singapore plan to cope in a world where it does seem that the US and China are going to diverge for in a lasting way. And, and we may hope not, but which there will at least occasionally be calls from one side or the other, you're with us or you're against mm. us. How do Singapore, how do other small 
economies deal with this situation? Well, small countries are also adept and nimble, and we will have to navigate this as best as we can. It's quite clear that the relationship between US and China is the most important relationship in the world and will have consequential impact on the future of the world. No one doubts that. It's indeed worrying that there is a loss of mutual trust and confidence on both sides. And relations have become more strained after the war. Uh, we see that there has been contact um, between the leaders, including at the highest levels. We hope that that will help to ensure that rational and sus sensible calculations are made and, and keep the relations hold so that you don't end up in a situation where there is complete divergence um, or you know, even outright confrontation, which will have disastrous impact for the whole world. Uh, I think part of this is how America chooses to respond to the rise of China. The fact is China is going to grow. The momentum is enormous, and it is, I think, unstoppable. How would then America respond to this rise? Uh, there was a view some years back, in fact, many years back, that the you know, US thought that the better approach would be to treat China as a stakeholder, bring it into the system, ensures that it has a vested interest in the status quo in the global system, including the international trading system, global financial markets, and because China has an interest, it will try its, do its part to make the system work, mm -hmm. make the system successful. That view has changed. Um, and understand, and in, incidentally, it is not as though that approach was wrong. I think it has benefited both sides. But over the years, I think the circumstances are different now because whatever trade arrangements and concessions given to China in the past, when it was just a fraction of the global economy, obviously will not be politically wearable, nor economically sensible, given China's weight in the world today. So adjustments do have to be made um, and, and should be made. But if you go beyond sensible adjustments and start to treat China as an enemy or contain China or keep, keep China out of the system, I'm not sure that we will have a better response um, or a better outcome. Uh, trying to contain China's rise, I think, will be very difficult. It will not be effective and will only um, cause China to redouble its determination to become more self-reliant, to grow its own little giants, and to, be, to develop its own indigenous technology. Keeping out China out of the system will only cause China to develop its own parallel system with its own international, with, with its own rules. Uh, so it's, I don't, if, if we were to end up in that kind of a world, I think it will be a very different world. And it will be highly destabilizing for everyone, including America. So we hope a better outcome will be for both sides to continue engagement, find ways to uh, work together on, on many issues where there are in fact shared interests the, the fact is, the reality is China will develop on its own and America will not be able to cause China to become more like America. But despite these differences, both US and China have many shared interests, not least on global issues like climate change, like pandemic response, or even non-nuclear proliferation. And if we can find a framework for the two sides to continue to compete, but within a framework of shared interest and interdependencies and work together on these shared issues for mutual benefit, I think we will be able to achieve a safer and better world. I personally and a number of our Peterson Institute colleagues broadly agree with you, but as you put your finger on it, this is a very contentious point in the American public debate and in Washington, and there has been a shift. So I fully I, understand. No, I know you do. <laughs> um, so I just want to push you a bit more on these points. So first, sort of high concept. China's leadership often resents the notion that they will be contained. 
containment was traditionally historically a national security concept that George Kennan and others can coin to discuss handling the Soviet Union after the Second World War. Is it possible to see a path forward where the US and its allies contain China from a national security point of view, say, having security alliances with Taiwan, with Singapore, with Japan, but allow them to grow economically? Or is it containment has to be both economic and security? Well, on the security front, you know, I'm sure America will continue to think through its options and develop security linkages. But what's important in thinking about security is also thinking about building institutions that will move us away from a path of a hot conflict down the road. I mean, think about what happened in Ukraine, for example, recently. It's not just about what happened recently, but it's right. about the accumulation of decisions made over years, even decades. Right. And so what's important now is to think about what sort of institutions can we form in the Asia Pacific? Mm -hmm. What sort of engagements can we have that would best deter countries away from a path of conflict? Mm -hmm. uh, and there are many possible engagement. So we shouldn't think about security and economy, economic engagement in sort of binary or sort of mutually exclusive terms. I think we should think of it more broadly as strategic engagement and building institutions that will enable a framework of shared interest and interdependencies to grow. So in that framework, would CPTPP have been better or worse if the US was engaged? And how do you feel about China applying to join CPTPP? Sure. Well, the, we it would have been better if the TPP had continued. Uh, if And now we have CPTPP, China is applying. But there are processes to handle these things. And we, we should go through the due process. Besides the CPTPP in Asia, we have APEC. Right. We have the East Asia Summit. And the Biden administration has now talked about a new Indo-Pacific economic framework, which we welcome and support, again, as a platform to engage Asia more substantively in a strategic and substantive way. So we hope that the framework will be effective. Uh, we hope countries will join. And I'm sure there are many countries in Asia looking forward to it. Um, and we also hope that this will be an engagement that is not just one-off, but is done consistently across different administrations, which is key in order to um, ensure America's standing in the region remains high. When, thank you, Minister, but again, just to pursue this, you listed a number of institutions that are being grown all of which are plurilateral, not multilateral, and which have, to use a nice phrase, variable geometry. Some have China in them, some have the US in them, almost none of them have both China and the US in them, a couple have neither. So even if we accept your principles and your vision for stability, how do you, you and the leadership of Singapore, as a, a major voice in all these groupings, how do you want to take that forward? Is it just have as many overlapping institutions as possible? Is there some kind of ordering of this? I don't think there is a magic formula or silver bullet to this. We want to have open and inclusive frameworks for all the major powers to engage Asia and the Asia Pacific and to have stakes in the region. So I think the more that happens, the stabler the region will be. In the APEC, US and China are present, so to the East Asia Summit. In the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, it's, it's an American initiative, but we would strongly encourage that this is a framework that remains open and inclusive too. It's not just about US and a few countries, but as broad a range of participation as possible. Of course, you can set standards of entry, so be it. Um, whatever the standards are, 
but keep it open, keep it inclusive. And down the road, if China were to say, we would like to join the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, well, if they meet the standards, why not? And if we were to have that in mind in designing our regional architecture, open, inclusive, ensuring that all the major powers have stakes in the region, I think that's a way for us to build shared interests, interdependencies, and that's a way for us to ensure a path away from a conflict down the road. Thank you for taking us through your vision of the path forward. I, I, I need to look backwards for one more thing on this topic. You mentioned that the US moved away from its stakeholder, in a sense, offer or, or engagement with China. But some, including in the US, but primarily in Asia, pointed out that the US never really was quite as forthcoming, or the EU quite as forthcoming, in allowing China and other Asian economies to become stakeholders, be it quota reform at the IMF and World Bank, be it share of development aid, be it changes at the WTO. How should we, I mean, just on the facts, how should we evaluate that? Would it matter if the US, would Chinese behavior change? Would Asian relationships change if the US and Europe suddenly said, you're right, it, it's past time for you all to have a bigger vote at the international institutions, for one example? Or is that boat sailed and it doesn't matter? I'm not sure that you can do anything that would guarantee a change sure. in behavior, but we are talking about what's the best way forward in building constructive relations and, and giving, uh, you know, and, and ensuring that China plays a more responsive, responsible role as a major player in the new global architecture. And from that point of view, I would say that um, given China's weight in the global economy now, certainly uh, issues of representation in these uh, institutions are relevant. They are relevant. And if over time these issues are not addressed, then from China's point of view, it may very well decide to build parallel institutions because it feels that it does not have adequate or fair representation. And, and having parallel systems is certainly not, uh, ideally, not the way forward. Um, in your opening remarks, you very powerfully pointed out some areas, Minister Wang, where the G7, G20 international community has led us down. That's my words, not your words but you pointed out the work still to be done on climate change, on pandemic prevention and financing, where your colleague and our friend Tharman has shown such leadership. Is there anything to be done with the international financial architecture that mm. would make it more likely we get progress on pandemic financing at even 0.02% of GDP, as you said? I mean, what is, what is the difficulty on these global public goods? What would you like to see change to achieve some of the things you spoke about? It, it is a complex issue, but we certainly think that there is scope to repurpose our international financial institutions for this big challenge of addressing global public goods. After all, the uh, in Bretton Woods institutions were set up 75 years ago, and it was a different world then. Uh, we are facing far more complex challenges, and you need stronger institutions to deal with them. So repurposing the institutions with an expanded mandate to be able to raise and deploy resources to provide for global public goods, I think is going to be something important. And one specific area which I talked about and we, we are familiar with is in the area of global health financing. It's an important issue. It's not just a healthcare issue because as we have seen from the pandemic, it can easily result in bad economic outcomes. And, and there are ways to go about doing it. We've done it for financial systems after all. We've learned from financial crisis and we have strengthened the system the global financial system to better prepare for future crises. Banks are better prepared. We have the ability to do so in the financial world. I think we should likewise be able to do so 
against future pandemics. Uh, what's the difficulty? Well, I think it's, it takes time. Um, I, you know, it's, there is fatigue around COVID-19, I can fully understand. Um, and people hope that the pandemic is over, but it is not over. And even if it's over, new pandemic will, will come. And of course, there are other very pressing global priorities now, not least the war in Ukraine. So there is a bandwidth issue, to, to be fair, but we certainly hope that, as I mentioned just now in my remarks, we will continue to be able to move forward on this important agenda in the G20 and other platforms. Thank you. Uh, we at the Peterson Institute and our global audience, I think, support you, your government, and the G20 in those efforts. Thank you all for joining us today for remarks and a conversation with Singapore's Minister for Finance and Deputy Chairman of the Monetary Authority of Singapore, Mr. Lawrence Wong. And please join us again throughout Macro Week here at the Peterson Institute, again today at 2 p.m. Eastern with the U.S. Deputy Treasury Secretary, Wally Adamayo. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adam. Good talking to you. Great to see you. Thank you.